The topic today is um, a data-driven hatchery and it's kind of Henry um, thir after 30 plus years managing uh, several different hatcheries and overseeing other hatcheries. Um, it's kind of a, an area that he um, is kind of passionate about of um, using our data and using it wisely and how do we run a hatchery using that. So he's put a very good presentation together talking about this and hopefully it'll um, shed some light on some things that maybe you're not doing or would like to do and how to do it. And, and again, if there's things that prick your interest that he doesn't cover, then we can cover it afterwards. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and, and let Henry take over and share a screen and start the presentation. And um, thank you all for participating and being here. And then we'll, uh, I'll see you at the, at the end for our question and answer section. So Henry, Cole, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. And welcome everyone. Let me, uh, get my screen shared here and we will begin. Hopefully everybody can see this. <clears throat> As Dr. Bramwell mentioned, we're going to talk about the data-driven hatchery. And for some reason, there we go. Um, like Dr. Bramwell mentioned, this is an area that I am rather passionate about is utilizing data effectively and efficiently to make good management decisions when running a hatchery. Or if you're, you know, running a breeder farm or grow up facility, again, same principles will apply. So in today's hatchery, we collect large amounts of data. So what are you doing with that data? Are you utilizing this data to make good management decisions? Or are you just collecting the data to be compliant with your company's requirements? Or some of both? Let's investigate why utilizing this data can help make better management decisions. So in today's presentation, we're going to start off looking at or discussing purpose of hatchery data collection. We'll go through what data is needed and by, by no means is this a totally inclusive list. There's a lot of data that's collected in the hatchery. I'm just giving you some highlights, some key, uh, some key data. We'll talk about data collection, different types of data collection methods. We'll talk about visuals, which is my favorite way to look at data, but we'll get into that. And then more importantly, what do you do with the data after it's been collected? And remember, try to keep things as simple as possible. If you get, too, if you get things too complicated, um, a lot of times uh, good decisions aren't made because your, your data, your information is, is too confusing. So try to keep things as simple as possible. So what's the purpose of our data? First, it should assist us in our daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal management decisions, such as, you know, every summer in, in North America, it, it gets hot, it gets humid. Do you run into a moisture loss issue? Well, if you're collecting this data, you can see seasonal impacts on moisture loss. So it's good to have that information handy and available. Monitor your chick and egg flows throughout the hatchery. Every hatchery needs to know how many chicks they have in or how many chicks they're sending out and how many eggs they have coming in so that they can make the proper sets and have the proper amount of chicks going out, ducklings going out, poults going out to the farms on a daily basis. We use data to monitor all aspects of compliance, animal welfare, safety, biosecurity, to name a few. We should use our data to monitor our SOPs, programs, and policies. Are we running the proper washer temps? Are we running the proper disinfects on our sanitation bars? Those types of things. We should use data to help troubleshoot issues. This is what I really love to use data for, is to help troubleshoot issues. Another key thing about data is when you're collecting it is to know what is normal. 
a lot of folks will disregard their data. They do what they have to with the data to send out their daily, weekly reports, but they're not really looking at it from a perspective of what is normal. What's your normal moisture loss in the winter? What's your normal moisture loss in the summer, fall, spring, those types of things. What's your normal um, ambient room temperature? So knowing what's normal is critical. So when you have an issue, you can then say, okay, this is what's normal and this is where we have an issue. And then like I mentioned earlier, monitoring trends. So what kind of data is important? Many companies require data to be collected, as I mentioned, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And this data can be sometimes overwhelming. Uh, you've got you know, compliance data, animal welfare, safety, biosecurity, got all this data that you have to collect and, and take care of. And sometimes it can be quite a mountain of paperwork and, and can be sometimes a daunting task. We also collect data or companies want data collected so that they can monitor your hatchery performance so that they can measure you against other hatcheries within that company or outside of that company. So what kind of data is needed? And again, this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just some, some main data that um, normally you're collecting within the hatchery. We've got flock numbers, your breeder flock number, breeder farm, breeder farm house number, flock age, that's, that's an important piece of information to know what the age of the flock or the age of the eggs coming in, what kind of breeds are you using, lay date, another good piece of critical information is we need to know the lay date on those eggs that are being set. Your set date, obviously, so you can calculate when they're, when they're supposed to hatch. How many eggs you're setting? That's, that's a good piece of data. We've got incubator data, hatcher data for temperatures, humidity, CO2. As I mentioned, animal welfare, biosecurity, safety, egg sanitation. This is data that I normally would get in the egg room, take a look in, and do an egg pack evaluation to see what kind of, how dirty my eggs are, or how clean my eggs are. Fan RPNs, whether you're in single stage, multi-stage machines, do you have issues with, with some fan speeds? Collecting fan RPMs is, is important. Moisture loss, I mentioned that earlier. You know, what's your average moisture loss? What's the average by flock? What about by incubator or by incubator hallway? Same with hatchability. What's, what's your average hatchability on a daily basis? What's your hatchability by flock? Do you calculate your hatchability by incubator or even by incubator hallway? There could be some differences. Same with hatch or fertile. A few weeks back, we taught, we had two webinars on residue breakout. You know, Dr. Bramwell went through this in, in great detail on early, mid deads and late deads. What does that data tell you? We've got our candle breakout, our fertility data, by flock, hatchery hygiene. What about, you know, are you seeing an increase or a rise in, you know, contamination after hatchers are clean? Or are you seeing, you know, hygiene issues after the, at the end of your uh, box wash or tray wash or something along those lines? Three and seven day livability. What does that data tell you? If you're running multi-stage machines, your multi-stage crossbar tents, important bit of information. Your cabinet pressures, if you're running multi-stage, again, really important information to make sure that equipment is running op or, uh, optimally. Your exit end temperatures. What about your room, your incubator room and plenum, your hatcher room and plenum, your temperatures, your pressures, and your humidity within those rooms? Number of clears, total hatch, cold percent, saleable checks, grade A checks, whatever you call it. 
all important bits of information. A lot of people, you know, because of animal welfare and compliance, they do alarm logs. And anytime there's an alarm, you're logging the alarm. But does anybody go back through and look at that alarm log? Are you seeing a pattern of the same incubator after you set is alarming? Or do you have a, a certain day of the week where you're seeing alarms sound off? It can key you into some issues that might be going on. Calibration logs. Most hatcheries that I go to have a real nice set of calibration logs. But do you go back through and, and look at that information? Do you have incubators or hatchers that every time you're checking calibration, it's off on calibration? That might key you in that something might not be right or that whoever's calibrating it isn't doing it properly. Generator logs. I know most people, you know, keep a log on their generators, their run times. If you're exercising that generator on a weekly basis and it's exercising for a half hour on every Wednesday, does anybody look and make sure it's actually exercising for a half hour or is it less? Are you, we need to take a look at this data that's being collected. Incubator, hatcher, room pressures, plenum pressures, as I mentioned. Here's some other bits of information. It's good to know your incubator number when you're collecting the data, what hatcher they're going into. So when you're pulling hatch, you know what machines these eggs came from, these, these chicks came from, so that you can then tie in, if you see an issue, it to an incubator or a hatcher. As I mentioned, you know, knowing what incubator hallway they came from or hatcher hallway. What's your air pressure? Not for the rooms, but for turning. What is that, what is that operating air pressure? Are you having turning issues? Take a look at your air pressure. Is it where it should be? What about your boiler temps, chiller temps? With all this data being collected, what is truly needed to make good management decisions and in, in on how the hatchery is running? Well, the answer is all of it. Um, and, then, and then some. There's, there's a lot of data that I didn't even mention that's being collected on a regular basis. And all of that should be used, should be looked at to help dial in your programs, your profiles, et cetera. So let's look a little bit about or look into data collection and the importance of data collection. As I mentioned, hatcheries collect a large amount of data to monitor and evaluate their equipment and operations of that hatchery. This data is a valuable resource for hatchery management to evaluate if there are any problems or to make any needed improvements if you utilize that data. Good data is worth much. It, is, it has value. Good data has a tremendous amount of value. In my opinion, poor data is worthless. You might as well not even have it. Don't even look at it because it, what it'll do is poor data can have you go down the wrong path in troubleshooting or making management decisions. A little good data, in my opinion, is far better than a lot of poor data because good decisions depend on good data. Bad decisions results in, or bad data results in bad decisions. I find this time and time again, and I've experienced this. So if your data isn't good, you might as well not even use it. So we'll talk a little bit about this uh, in, in a little bit here. So how often and how much data should be collected? I get asked this question quite a bit. And the answer is you need to collect whatever data your company requires and you need to collect it as often as they require it, period. Um, that's what they want. That's what you need to provide for them. When you collect that data, at least do something with it. You're, you're spending the man hours to collect that data, do something with it. 
And then also collect as much data as you can without sacrificing the quality of the data. Again, remember just the slide before, bad data equals bad decisions. So we don't wanna sacrifice quality of our data. If there's data that's not required by your company that you feel will help you make better decisions, then I would say go ahead and start collecting that data. But when you do, do something with it. Again, if you're spending man hours collecting that data, you really need to do something with it. Otherwise, you might as well not even waste your time. So let's look at different types of data. We have data for compliance, animal welfare, biosecurity, safety. We've got data to help us make good management decisions. We've got automated data collection where we have computerized um, software programs that will capture incubator, hatcher um, data in a real time basis. Our Innovo vaccination equipment, a lot of times will capture computerized data as well on how many clears you're seeing, those types of things. Uh, if you have equipment to monitor and control your room temperatures, humidities, pressures, plenum pressures, all of that stuff can be controlled uh, automatically. And, and depending on what kind of uh, computerized software programs you have, you can then capture that data and, and analyze it and do things with it. So for example, Hatchcom. We provide Hatchcom, it's a computerized software program where you can monitor and control your incubators, your hatchers, coupled with the Guardian system, which monitors the uh, ventilation within a hatchery. If you have Guardian system and Hatchcom, you can then control your incubators, hatchers, room, room temperatures, plenum pressures, room pressures, you can control everything. With our pilot eggs, and the pilot eggs are only for our North American customers, the pilot eggs are, are useful as well. And what they do is they will actually take control of your incubator and, op and run your inc incubator based off of the shell temperature that's in on the eggs within that incubator. So you're, you're optimizing your incubation parameters based on egg shell temperature. And what you can do with that data is then uh, take that data, look at that data and tweak and enhance your, your own incubation profiles. For example, if you don't have profiles for young flock, young breeder flocks or old breeder flocks, you could ut utilize pilot egg information and develop a, a young breeder profile or old breeder profile, that type of thing. Hatch Sense is, 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 a bit of, is a bit of software and an apparatus that we put on our hatch baskets. And what it'll do is it'll then take control of your um, hatcher once it senses movement within that hatcher and will help shorten up that hatch window and optimize hatch, the hatching process um, within that hatcher. So with data collection, optimizing hatchery performance entails, as I mentioned earlier, a good understanding of the data being collected. You need to ha have an understanding of your data being collected. And then you also need to know how that data is being collected. As a hatchery manager or a hatchery supervisor, it's important that you understand how that data is being collected, when it's being collected, and who is collecting that data. And then also good data analysis is critical. Many hatcheries still have most of their data being collected and stored on paper. This truly limits your ability to analyze that data. And as an industry, we really need to strive and move forward to getting this data into an electronic format as soon as we can. Electronically stored data is much more valuable it can be turned into graphs, exported, linked to other files, to other data, which improves the efficiency of your data analysis. 
So different types of data collection. As I mentioned, a lot of hatcheries still collect um, data on paper. And as I mentioned, this is not ideal. Ideally, we'd like to collect and store our data electronically by utilizing electronic barcode readers, data collection tablets, and this helps for the ease of use and data analysis. You can have simple Excel spreadsheets on these tablets to enter your data, or you can have sophisticated software programs, but we don't really need those sophisticated programs. We can do that with simple Excel spreadsheets. As I mentioned earlier, we talked about automated data collection with, incubator, with incubators, hatchers. They continually monitor your incubator and hatcher conditions through Hatchcom. They continue to monitor your room and plenum conditions with, with the Guardian system that we provide coupled with Hatchcom. And, and that gives you, you know, continual monitoring 24-7, 365 of the conditions not only in your incubator, but in the rooms as well. So <clears throat> this is what I call the collect and respond data. And what I mean by collect and respond data is as you're collecting this data, you don't need a whole lot of data analysis. If it's not right, you fix it. So for example, multi-stage machines, if you're, not have, if you're not running the right cabinet pressure within that machine, you need to get maintenance to take a look at why we're not running that right cabinet pressure. What's going on? Do we have um, the exit end damper open too far? Entrance end damper closed too much? Do we have um, seals or gaskets that are torn or missing? What's going on to create um, a condition where our cabinet pressures aren't correct? Crossbar temps, again, if it's not right, if you're running a 98.8 degree um, incubator, multi-stage incubator, your crossbar should be 100.3 24 hours after um, you set the eggs. If it's not, what do you, you know, you need to investigate that. Exit end temps, same thing. Washer temps, if your washer isn't running at the right temperature, don't just walk past it, don't record the data and just walk past it. You need to investigate what's going on. Same with your boiler, same with your chiller, same with your fan RPMs. If you have maintenance, checking fan RPMs and there's one that's way off, fix it, take care of it, replace that motor, do something. Don't just record it and say, my job is done, respond. Room temperatures, room humidity, your plenum pressures, your operating air pressures for turning. And the list goes on and on. This is just a, a few of those that we're, that we're talking about. But again, this is the collect and respond data. Stuff you don't need to, you know, you don't need to spend a whole lot of time analyzing it, you know, putting in regression lines or anything along those lines. It's out of specs, fix it. Here's some data where you need to collect, you need to analyze so that you can respond. You know, your hatch are fertile, you know, What's your trends in hatch fertile? What's your moisture loss doing? Your, your hatchability, your fertility. A lot of times, well, fertility is not much you can do as far as the hatchery, but you can certainly inform the breeder department. So let's look at data analysis. Evaluating data is, is cr a critical job function as far as I'm concerned for hatchery management. And it should be done on a daily basis. When I was running a hatchery, every evening, that last, that last hour of the day that I spent in the hatchery, I spent looking at the data from the previous day. And at that time, we were collecting everything. This is a long time ago, folks. So we were putting everything on paper. I would then you know, enter everything into simple Excel spreadsheets. And then I could look at you know, my history, my trends, what's going on, not only within an incubator, but within an incubator hallway, those types of things. In many hatcheries, this data is usually recorded on sheets of paper at the end of each day. Now you then need to sort through the numerous pages of data 
and it makes it tough to analyze and review historical data. I've been at hatcheries and I'm leafing through stacks of, of data just to look at, you know, hatch numbers or breakout information. It makes it very, very difficult, very time consuming to analyze this data. Now, putting it on paper might be the easiest way to record the information uh, for daily production for your company's, um, you know, for your boss or for the company or whatever. But it certainly does not allow you to deep to dig in and do a deeper analysis of the data, like the effects of flock age, uh, egg storage time on hatchability, hatchery performance compared to the previous year, and so on and so forth best breeder forms, those types of things. So I recommend entering data into an electronic format for ease of data analysis. If you're, if you're still collecting data on paper, you, I highly encourage you to, to go the next step and put it into a spreadsheet of some sort. So again, on data analysis, to effectively monitor the performance of your hatchery and the equipment, it's vital that the data is collected, stored, and analyzed properly. Good data analysis requires the data to be stored in some sort of database and not just on paper. The quality of the data is only as good as the data being collected. Any errors in your data will result in data analysis being flawed. And this is where the good data is critical. If you have any errors, it, you need to find those errors and you need to get those taken out so that you can look at good data so that you can make the proper decision. So this comes into data validation. <clears throat> and data validation is, is taking a look at your data and to make sure the data makes sense and to remove any out before data analysis can begin, it's imperative that you validate that data, make sure it's good. Go through the data, make sure it makes sense. Go through the data and remove your outliers. And the outliers are data that's way out in left field or right field, um, something that truly sticks out. And I'll have some examples of that here in a moment. One thing that I do, a trick that I always do, <clears throat> for me, it's much easier for me to look at the data when it's in a visual, um, when it's visual to me. So I like to graph my data. By putting this data, if you got a spreadsheet with, with numerous amounts of data, say on hatchability or hatch or fertile or whatever, <clears throat> excuse me, you can take that data and, and easily make a quick graph doesn't take but a minute to make a graph and you can quickly spot any obvious errors in that data. For example, here, flock A, we're looking at some fertility data. <clears throat> you know, we're looking at somewhere around um, upper 80s and all of a sudden we have a spike here in, in fertility. Uh, something's not right there. So, you know, what happened? And what it was, was a data entry area error. So instead of putting, you know, a, a fertility of 89, they put in 99. Um, so those things happen when you're transcribing data, when you're entering data, sometimes that data will get messed up. So it's important to not include that when you're doing your data analysis because it will skew that data. Here's another one, looking at hatchability on a flock. <clears throat> Here we're, you know, running mid to low 80s, and all of a sudden we're mid 90s. What happened? We had a da data entry error. Chicks got mixed with another flock. This happens. This happens in a hatchery. I don't think there's a hatchery out there where they haven't mixed chicks from another flock. Well, you can't include that data if, if you want to have accurate data and accurate results. So you need to get that fixed. 
So continuing with data analysis, data analysis is vital in assisting the hatcher, hatchery manager in monitoring your incubator hatcher conditions, room and plenum pressures and conditions, your block performance, egg handling practices, SOPs, programs, policies. I mentioned looking for trends. Is your moisture loss increasing or decreasing? Are you seeing an increase or in late or early dead embryos? It's important to know what your trends are doing. <clears throat> and reviewing the data daily will provide timely information to assist in early detection of potential problems. And again, it's important to do this daily. As I mentioned, it will help with early detection of potential problems. You're gonna find it a lot quicker instead of waiting until all heck breaks loose. So again, I mentioned I like using visuals and charts and it helps me look at the data. I, the, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, it tells me a lot. There's a lot of information that can be gleaned from, from bar charts, from graphs, those types of things. Here's an example of somebody of, of some information, single stage versus multi-stage and grow out. And in, in the light blue um, bars, that's our single stage uh, information. And this is pounds of live weight. And the, the dark maroon bars are your multi-stage. And in this particular study, there was a, a difference in a positive impact on chicks from multi-stage incubators versus, I mean, single stage incubators versus multi-stage when the birds went into the processing plant. So we had better, better yields or better live weight going into the plant from our single stage. Here's one, a company that um, spent money on uh, revamping their ventilation within their hatchery. So for you folks that are requesting capital to re redo your ventilation or redo something, you can utilize that data and show your boss, show the company that the money was well spent. Here, the new ventilation was installed, and you can see the hatch of fertile improved. The top, this top line is the, is the fertility um, for this particular company. This is the hatch of fertile, and this is actual hatchability. Here's another company that put in some ventilation equipment, hoping to see improved hatchability, improved hatch of fertile. And again, it, it did. So you can utilize this data to substantiate, you know, that capital investment that you were given. And you can show your boss that, yes, you know, thanks for that capital investment. Our hatch of fertile, our hatchability has gone up because of this new ventilation or this new piece of equipment. So uh, another example of a use of your data. As I mentioned, for our North American customers, we do offer pilot. And I mentioned earlier about the pilot eggs and what we can do with that. The pilot, these pilot eggs will run your incubator, incubators based off of shell temperature. And we can then derive, take that data after, the, um, after we've transferred the eggs, we can then take that data and we can help tweak and modify and build new profiles, say profiles for young breeder flocks, old breeder flocks, seasonal profiles, those types of things. Our hatch sense data. This was, this was from some turkey data. And as I mentioned, hatch sense, the way it works is it will then start running and, and modifying the conditions within the hatcher based off of when movement is detected within, within that hatcher. So when you, when you pull hatch and you take a look at your data, you can, you'll see something like this. Is like in this particular case, movement was detected at 25 days, 15 hours. Remember, this is turkeys. Is that normal? You know, what is normal for your hatchery? Is that normal? 
or is this later than normal, earlier than normal? What about your um, hatch peak when it was detected? In this particular situation, hatch peak was detected at 26 days, 17 and a half hours. Is that normal? If it's not, this is a good way to start looking at some of those things. Hatchcom, I mentioned Hatchcom earlier. There's a lot of things we can do with Hatchcom, especially if you have the Guardian system as well. You can take a look at individual incubators, your incubator room, uh, you can control that, you can monitor that, your hatcher rooms, your plenums, your hatchers, all kinds of things you can collect with the Hatchcom. So for example, if you pull up incubator two, you'll see over here, you've got, uh, you can run a numeric report or you can run a graph on everything since, I mean, since you implemented that Hatchcom, you, you, can, you can pull all kinds of data up. You can pull six months, three months, whatever data you want on how that incubator has been operating. Very useful information. You can do the same for hatchers. Incubator rooms, what's going on? You can control your room temperature, humidity. You can adjust your pressures. You can also take a look at it in a graph format, or you can get numeric data if, if you're a person that likes to look at a bunch of numbers. I'm not that person. I like to look at data that's been graphed or being graphed. Again, with plenums. You can do the same thing. You can control your plenum pressures um, with, with the Hatchcom and Guardian combo. You can graph what your plenum's been doing, or you can look at the numeric data. Another thing you can do with uh, visual graphs is help identify a problem and see if your troubleshooting is helping. In this particular situation or this particular example, we're looking at three and seven day livability. Because we all know that, you know, a lot of that is, um, is the hatchery's responsibility. Anyway, um, so in this particular case, you know, our three and, and seven day livability is trucking along quite nicely. And then something changes around this time and things start getting worse. The hatchery responds and things start to appear to get better, but it's short-lived and things actually get even more. Oh, it gets worse, uh, a lot more worse. So until we found the root cause and the problem was corrected, did we get back to a stable situation? So it's, it, this is, very useful information to help identify, hey, you have a problem and that whether or not your troubleshooting methods are improving or if they're not improving. You can look at graph data, visual data to see if you have an issue with a particular process. In this particular process, we saw this graph earlier. We had data error, chicks got mixed with another flock. Well, that needs to be corrected. But more importantly, how often is this happening? <clears throat> is this happening weekly, daily, um, once a year? So if, if this problem is happening quite a bit, we might need to investigate what's going on at hatch pull. What's going on in the separator room? What's going on in, in the chick processing room? Where, is it, where are the chicks getting mixed? So it, it'll help identify if you have an issue with your process. Another thing is, um, you know, taking a look at the data. When you see these sawtooth sharp spikes up or down, typically <clears throat> in a biological system, you're not going to see that. You're gonna see, you should see smooth lines. You should certainly not see these jagged lines typically in, in, your, in your hatchery. If you do, there's some sort of outside influence. So, you know, what strikes me right away is this is hatchability data and we're hatching over 100%. Can't be folks. 
Um, we had an error, chicks got mixed. What about this? What about this one down here? You know, what do you think? What do you think's going on here? Um, we had an incubation issue, and I believe it was it was a turning issue. So you can see, you know, the results of that, and then Hatch kind of went back to back to normal. So very useful to use these visuals. Another one is comparing different flocks. You can compare. You can use same data and compare different incubators. You could use, you can compare different incubator hallways. It all works the same way. But this data tells me quite a bit of information just by looking at this. You've got this flock, flock number two in yellow, that's way up here around 95% hatchability. Great. But why are the rest not up here? What's going on here? Um, that's one question. Another question, this flock, this dark blue line, flock number five, what's going on here? Could it be a, a young breeder flock? Yeah, could be. But why is it taking nearly 20 weeks to get up to the hatchability that you want? Something's going on. What about this green one, flock number four? Could it be an older flock? You know, hatchability is starting to tail off. Those are things that when you take a look at the data, the data should prompt you, we prompt you with a lot of questions. That's why I like looking at this versus looking at, you know, a spreadsheet with numeric numbers. It, to me, this is a lot easier to visualize and see what's going on versus a whole bunch of numerical data. Again, that's for me. So, we're, we've collected the data. <clears throat> We're now gaining some knowledge. The next step is we need to take action. We need to make a decision and we need to act now. Doing something costs something. Doing nothing costs something. And quite often, doing nothing costs a lot more. And that's by Ben Feldman. And, and the reason I put this in there is because a lot of times we get to this, we get to this bridge and do we cross that bridge and do we act? A lot of folks are, are petrified, afraid, scared to make a decision because they're afraid something's gonna get worse. Yeah, that could happen, but doing nothing isn't gonna change anything and you're still gonna get the same results if not worse, if you don't do anything. So, and nobody can fault you if you're collecting the data and you're doing a good data analysis and you're making or you're trying to make a good informed decision. You know, if you're afraid, you know, that there might be some repercussions, you know, get your boss involved and, and, and both of you look at the data and both of you come up with some, some ideas and decisions to make, but doing nothing costs you a whole lot more. And I see that a lot of times where just people just don't do anything until the point where their boss, the company is screaming at them that, hey, you got some serious issues going on here and you got to get it fixed and you got to get it fixed now. I'm a person that if I start seeing things go south, I want to get it fixed right away. I don't want my boss coming to me and saying, hey, you need to get that fixed now. That's the way I ran my hatcheries. <clears throat> You need to take appropriate action based on your data. If your data indicates your moisture loss is too much, you need to take action. If it's not, if your moisture loss is not enough, do something about it. What if you've got um, higher early, higher early embryonic loss? You need to take action. What if you have issues with your incubator or hatcher? Do something about it because action is the only way things will change. If you're still confused, unsure, unclear, bewildered, it's okay to ask for help. You're more than welcome to get a hold of James Way, get a hold of myself, Dr. Bramwell, Philip Perry, Bill Bennett, Hatchery salesmen, your uh, James Way salespeople, and ask for some help. We'd be more than happy to help you any way we can.
And we do that. We do that for customers. I want to talk briefly on running a hatchery field trial. A lot of times when I go into a hatchery and I say, hey, I suggest or I recommend trying something, I get a response from the hatchery manager or hatchery supervisor. Yeah, we tried that once and, it, and we didn't see anything. Well, you know, did you run a good hatchery field trial? <clears throat> Don't be afraid to try and, and run some field trials. Again, you know, depending on what company you're in, you may, need, you may need to ask for some permission to do some of this, you know, talk with your boss about it, but don't be afraid to try and run some trials to try to make some performance improvements within your hatchery. First thing, when running a hatchery field trials, make sure all of your parameters, all of the factors are the same, except for the one per parameter or one factor that you're testing. So if you're testing incubation an incubation profile, you want to make sure that if you're running a couple different incubators that you take the eggs and you evenly dis you in evenly distribute those eggs from each of the breeder flocks into each of those incubators. It's important. You also need to have a control group in that trial. So you need to have one incubator on this particular example that you're running your normal profile and one incubator with your new altered profile. You need to have the same number of, of eggs from each breeder flock within those machines. We don't want to do a test on one or two trays, not enough eggs to get a good reliable, to get good reliable data. Whether you're seeing positive or negative results from that control group. You know, I always like to use 10, 20,000 eggs to make sure that I have a substantial amount of data when I'm, when I'm running these tests. Another key thing is repeat the field trial several times to make sure your results are consistent. A lot of times people will run the test, but they'll run it once. They didn't see any results. So it, it, in their minds, it didn't do any good. I suggest at least running a test three times. Even if the first time you don't get good results, run it at least three times to see if, it, if it's repeatable. When repeating the trial, change the incubator and hatcher that you're using for the control and test treatment. That's important. If you're always using the same incubator or same hatcher, for the test treatment and the same one for the control, you might have incubator effect or hatcher effect. You need to switch that up. And then finally, we'll look at some advice. To wrap up this, this presentation, I recommend entering raw data into an electronic, into an electronic format for ease of data analysis. Do not enter calculations as raw data. A lot of times I see people entering, you know, hatchability or whatever data, they're already in, they're entering calculations into the raw data. Enter your raw data, let your spreadsheet, you can make simple formulas to, to make those calculations. So don't enter calculations as raw data. For me, utilize visual aids for your data, such as graphs, bar charts, as I've shown you previously. For simple data analysis, you can just use simple Excel spreadsheets. If you want to get a little more sophisticated, you can go into pivot tables. Um, when you get into Excel, they have, they have an auto tutorial on how to do pivot tables. You can do graphs. There's a lot of things you can do very simply. Set aside time daily for data analysis. I can't stress that enough. I used to set you know, my last hour of the day looking at my data. It's important to, to know what's going on so you can see any trends and see if you're starting to go in the wrong direction. Data needs to be good and it needs to be realistic. Remember, bad data gives you bad decisions. The use of Excel pivot tables charts can be extremely powerful tools to help organize data and present this 
in a useful way, useful and meaningful way to your boss, to your company, in meetings, that type of thing. And then finally, never, never, never send out data that has not been validated. Nothing would upset me more when I had a subordinate come to me with data and it was not validated and I have, you know, a hatch percent over a hundred or I have, you know, for me, when I see data like that, I can't trust that data. So if you're sending out data, never send out data unless it's been validated because it makes you look bad if you're sending out poor data. And with that, I will entertain any questions. Thank you, Henry. That was, that was very good. Um, I have a, a, an area that I've noticed is lacking, at least in the past, too. People gather data and don't know what to do with it. Um, so, um, yeah, very good. But if they gather data, you know, they can ask us. Right. They, you know, they can get a hold of me. They can get a hold of you, Philip, Bill, and we'll be more than happy to help them. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 how, like you said, there's a lot of lot of um, need on how to um, gather it or collect it, organize it, so you can look at it. But then also knowing how to interpret it. You know, some of the things are easier to interpret than others. But some, you know, what does it actually mean? And like you said, that's where you'd come to you or or somebody to help. Best help with the interpretation. Yeah, um, in, in, in most companies have have folks that are good with data. I mean, right. you can ask you can ask somebody within your own company um, that's that's good with interpreting data to see right. what you know what they think as well. So yeah, um, but yeah, if you're not sure, you know, ask for some help. Yep. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about the Hatchcom and how to access that? One of the questions was. Um, can you see that on your phone? And how 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 would somebody look at that remotely? Because I, I know a lot of people do, but some people want to. Um, can you oh. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, Hatchcom to to access at least right now to access that remotely, you need to have Team Viewer. And so, like if you're at home, if you have Team Viewer and you have Team Viewer on your Hatchcom computer, you can remote in. But again. A lot of companies are very sensitive, their IT department is very sensitive about remoting in on a company computer. So obviously you have to get approval from your IT department, whether or not you can even do this, whether or not they'll even allow you to put this uh, um, team viewer on there. But you can also put team viewer on your phone. And I've done this before and you can, and you can remote in. Now, when you use it on your phone, you are very limited. You you basically can monitor what's going on. You really can't make a whole lot of change. You can't make any changes off your phone, but but you can at least review what's going on. Right, right. And that and that is an important thing to be able to do to to look at that. And so a lot of people use tablets or something. But really, the team viewer, what it's allowing you to do. And I actually had this question yesterday from somebody. It's it's really giving you remote access to a computer. And, yes. and so it's not really getting into Hatchcom, it's remote access to that computer. And so a lot of people will have designated computer for, for that, just so if there, somebody's getting remote access and looking at it, they're not looking at somebody else's work and typing. But, but that's what that's doing, is it's just giving you access to a computer. And I think there's other mechanisms to use that. We use TeamViewer a lot. There's other ways that people- Yeah, there's other that. software that allows you access. And you're exactly right, Keith. Uh, that team viewer gives you access to that particular computer. Yeah. And that's why IT gets a little sticky about that um, because you, you then, you know, if that computer is tied into, you know, a company database. Um, yeah. Can create some issues there. Yeah. And, and you can kind of control that as far as if you wanted to give somebody access to it. I mean, I, I think as a hatchery manager, you would probably want it all the time, but if you would want to give somebody else to it, you can give that to them and then later change the access um, password so they can't get on it all the time. And yeah. we, we get that with people. Correct. The nice thing about team viewer is it has um, a, um, a password it's password protected. So you, you can change up that password, you know, frequently, yeah. however frequently you want. 
So it, there, there is some security with that. But again, please check with your your company whether or not they allow that or not. Right, right. <clears throat> you talked a little bit about and kind of you made your little comment. I caught it anyway about the three and seven day livability. <laughs> the yes. hatcher is always Thank responsible you. for that. I I did notice that little. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll leave that <laughs> there. But we we do we do have some responsibility for that. Um, oh, absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, so so somebody had asked about that. They said, okay, with your three and seven day mortality, um, you know, if you've got like a lot of contamination in the hatchery that's affecting that, I mean, yeah, we have that, but I mean, what other things in that hatchery might affect that three and seven day mortality that you've seen? I know you've worked with some people on that and trying to correct that. Since, since we are kind of tied to that, <laughs> what are some of the things you've seen in the hatchery that would help? With that. Well, obviously contamination issues, set timing. Set timing is, is critical. If the chicks are set too early and now they're sitting in a hatcher and they're dehydrating on you in a hatcher, um, that will create issues once the chicks get out on the farm. Vice versa, if your set timing isn't correct and it's too late and you have green chicks that you're sending out to the farm, Green chicks never do well out on the farm, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, so set timing is important. You know, your incubation profiles, did you do you have any issues with your incubators? Um, do you have inc issues with the ventilation and um, plenums on the incubator side? Same on the hatcher side. If you have issues with your exhaust plenums, you have issues with your hatcher profile either speeding up, slowing things down can create issues. So, I mean, there's a whole host of things that can create issues. It's just taking the data saying, okay, yeah, this is what we have going on. And then you start systematically going through one by one to see what the root cause is. Yeah. You know, looking at the data, you, I mean, yes, we, we may have some ideas, but you need to start making some changes and, you know, in, in one particular situation that I've been working with, I mean, it took a couple months to get the situation corrected. You know, we systematically went through line item by line item to, to get those things, you know, ticked off. And then we, you know, and then we finally stumbled on, you know, what the root cause was. So we kind of laugh about that sometimes because obviously we can send a chick out and, and the brooding conditions, you know, are really contribute to that three and seven day livability. But if we produce a quality platinum chick, send it to the hatchery, it has a much better chance of, of doing well with proper um, brooding Absolutely. conditions. But Absolutely. not, I mean, they can, they can make a mess of it and it may not be the hatchery's fault, but we've got to give a good chick and that's a good measure. Correct of that right. what what way um do you means do you kind of use to evaluate a hatchery efficient efficiency i mean i you know i depend on who you're talking to i mean most people's like well hatch is what the whole program they want chicks well then you've got hatch a fertile and and then you you know you got some other things in your opinion when you looked at it what did you really the most important data to tell you your hatchery was running efficiently well, your hatchability data one, your hatch of fertile data is, is, is very important as well. Um, my moisture loss, I always knew what my moisture loss was any day, any day of the week. Um, your breakout data, what's, what's that telling you? Those, those, are the, those are the key ones. And then, you know, then if you're starting to see some issues, you can, you can delve into, you know, your, through Hatchcom, looking at your, your hatch data. I mean, as far as how the hatcher is performing or your incubator, but the critical ones is, and then chick quality, uh, that's another one there, is, yeah. is looking at your chicks on a daily basis. As a hatchery manager, you know, I always was in the hatchery first and, and looked at chicks prior to pull and then looked at my chicks throughout the day as they're being processed or ducklings being processed. And then prior to being shipped, what do they look like? So looking at the quality, if you look at your chick quality, you're looking at, you know what your hatchability is, your hatch are fertile and um, your breakout data that you should be doing on a daily basis. That'll give you a pretty good picture of what's going on in the hatchery. Yeah. 
And and understanding what what um, breed strains, I think somebody had a question about that. Is like what's a, what's the standard for that breed, and understanding that. And right. I think most of the time we work with, you know, with genetics that are good. You know, there were you know, but you know, when we start working with alternative species, maybe, and you know, that don't have the fertility where we might have issues. So understanding what the breed standards are, as Correct. well. In in and I mentioned you know understanding and knowing your data and and what's normal and right. You need, you need to know that, you know, if you, if you're a hatchery that has several different breeds or several different strains, you know, what's normal for each one. It's important to know that. Okay. Um, I know we just talked about this, but it, it came up again by, by a question. Um, you know, sometimes they said their mortality, they don't, they don't really, I mean, a lot, sometimes you can look at, okay, this is our hatchability, hatch fertile, you know, and seven day livability, we, we got a good chick, we got good livability. What happens if somebody says, okay, we have very good hatch, but we have high mortality at the farm. I mean, you know, I've kind of talked about that. Can you just kind of discuss that again? Uh, you know, if, if we're as a hatchery are saying, hey, we think we have good chicks, but we're not getting the, the response back from the farm, we're getting high mortality. Okay, so we have good quality chicks going out. Yes. Okay. So, you know, if, if we've done our homework, we have good, good quality platinum chicks going out of the hatchery. Um, then, you know, you've, you've got to ask the question. You've got to talk to the folks on the grow outside, um, you know, what's going on there. I mean, and there's, I mean, there's some things that, you know, if brooding's not right, um, if the room or the barn isn't up to temperature properly, you know, especially come winter time, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of these contract growers, you know, they have to pay for their own fuel. So yes, they'll warm that the ambient temperature up to, you know, say 90 degrees, 95 degrees. But the concrete floor, even though they've got some shavings on top of it, that concrete floor may still be only 70 degrees, 75 degrees, and can suck the heat right out of those chicks. So I mean, there's a whole host of things. And you, you need to to, to do any troubleshooting, especially across other departments, you need to have a good relationship with, you know, a hatchery manager needs to be kind of like a politician, kind of like a, a David Hammond, you know, he needs to be able to converse in, in, in talk with the, the breeder folks. And then he needs to be able to converse and, and talk with the folks on the grow outside. And, you know, you guys need to work as a team this needs to be done in conjunction to to help solve that problem. And I, and it kind of goes back to this particular topic today is have data, you know, to, right. to, to kind of work with them and say, hey, they're just not doing well. Show them numbers, you know, show numbers, show data, say this is where we used to be and, the, and this is where we are now. So numbers talk. And yeah, I think, it, I believe it was you and I that had this discussion with um, you know, a customer at one point is they were looking at some mortality issues they had um, from a hatchery and there a lot of discussion with it and then come to find out it's it only a few farms and it was always those few farms. That's the other thing we need to do is like, if you have high mortality, is it across the board with all your farm, all chicks going to all farms? And then you look at more of a management, a company management system. If you're like, there's a few farms, but all the other chicks coming out even that same day um, are, are doing well, and you just got a few, then, you know, can we really tie that to a hatchery issue is if you sent out 200,000 chicks and, you know, a quarter of them had high mortality and the others didn't, and, you know, then it's like, okay, there's some other things at play there. So that's where your data comes in is not comparable. Right. Exactly. And that's what I was going to say. But as a hatchery manager, if you have your data and you have your, you know, your, your key metrics, your moisture loss, your breakout data, because, you know, a lot of times when you're in grow out and, and your chicks are dying, you're going to blame the hatchery, but, and, and you're going to, and there'll be all kinds of things going, oh, the chicks are overheated, blah, 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 you know, poor incubation conditions. Well, that's where your breakout data is important and taking a look at your breakout data and, and having that. And you can show that to your boss, to the grow out folks, whatever, that, hey, look, if, if we had incubational issues, we will see issues in our breakout data. 
Right. You can't have overheating in grow out if, and you can't have overheated chicks in grow out if you didn't have overheated chicks, you know, if you're not seeing overheated chicks in, in your breakout, unless you had some overheating in, in transport or something along those lines. But if it's an incubational issue, you will see it in your, in right. your breakout data. So having that data will cover your, cover your rear end. Right, right. Helps you in making decisions and also helps protect yourself sometimes and, and protect yourself, but then also to troubleshoot and things. So, um, but um, anyway, well, the, very good uh, discussion, very good presentation on that, Henry. I think that's a lot of uh, good information a lot of people can use on how to, um, you know, how to use that data that we collect. And, uh, and I think you probably pointed out some things in there, some areas that maybe people aren't currently collecting. Some of the, some of the data, the items that you mentioned, um, and then the importance of it. So very good, Henry. Appreciate it. As always, did a did a good job with the presentation. And thank you all for coming and participating with yeah, our thank you. webinar. And and look for uh, future topics um, coming up um, in in the future. And uh, again, all of our webinars, um, past webinars, are available on our website. Go check out the website, uh, look at those, and and review them, and and kind of see if there's something you missed. Um, you know, we may cover it again, but if not, um, you need it now, we, we might have it there. So thank you all again for participating and I look thank forward you. to seeing you in the next, next round.